flat landscape, it's naturally windy. There's nothing to stop the wind. When we design a good, healthy, treed landscape, there's no wind, we buffer the wind. But what do we do? We develop our human landscapes to look like this, featureless, without any vegetation, just for production of human real estate space. We'll show you how we can produce landscapes that are permanent and permanently productive and food secure. Okay, come with me into Village Homes, Davis, California, and we'll show you what you can really do with flat land when you want to convert it into abundance in human settlement. This is mainstream America. Car culture, road culture, but 100% runoff of water. Clever design, simple little features. Capturing that storm water here with a conventional system goes straight into unconventional food abundance by the way we design that water capture. Not waste and runoff, not dump and extract, but actually deposit. So in here, I get down in this drain here, and here it is. Here's the pipe. There. The water's here. It's actually storm water sitting there, soaking in. And we're in midsummer, and yet it's damp here. Captured in food systems throughout the human settlement. Very sensible and should be the only way we settle land. Ah, this is the input where we capture the runoff water of neighboring suburbs. Simple but clever design can make all the difference for capturing the energy in the system. Here it is, a simple water gate, picks up the water flow off the suburb, slows it down, drops it in, and soaks it into productive abundance. A benefit of a suburb anywhere on Earth. So we have crossing pipes coming in here from road catch off swales. Swales and road catch together. Underneath a footbridge and on down hydrating green space through the suburb. So the roads here are really multifunctional here. The kerb is designed to pick up the water, passively run it down over these rocks and it joins the swale water and becomes a benefit to the landscape. We have a very subtle little water swale here, meandering its way through next to the footpath. It's filled with gravel with all kinds of little perennial plants. It's a general water flow as part of the feature of the subdivision. I'm sitting on a swale footbridge. There are little crossing pipes and swale footbridges all the way through this landscape. And it's kind of intricate the way the swales shape the patterning of this landscape. And it's kind of crucial to understand that this is an absorption system towards the productive forest. In the first year, the measurements gave about three feet, one meter of hydrated soil below these swales. In the second year, it was eight to nine feet, about three meters of not saturated, but dampened geology, dampened subsoil below these swells. And in the third year, there was 18 feet of dampened soil and subsoil below the subdivision. So we started here 
to rehydrate the landscape, perch and aquifer. And once you get nine meters of dampened hydrology in this climate, you can grow any trees within the temperature range. There's no point in measuring anymore. You've got everything you need in the moisture rehydration of this landscape. Swale after swale, pipe after pipe, road after road, the water is designed to be a benefit to the landscape in this subdivision. Pomegranates, figs, citrus. I'm surrounded by fruit. I'm surrounded by food on the ground. This is everything that I teach. This is everything that I say is possible. Here it is in reality, 30 years old. This is a model. You cannot purchase this. You cannot plant 30 year old trees. Doesn't matter how much wealth you have, this is the true wealth of abundance within human settlement. This is what we need to realize is possible. Here it is, we need to extend it. We can go on from here and we can live in the paradise that we truly deserve as intelligent designers. Here we are in Village Homes Davis and I'm with Michael Corbett, the architect of this amazing, iconic urban settlement, high density urban settlement actually. Um, and uh, Michael, you're going to give us a, a bit of a rundown on how it all happened. So I was looking for uh, a piece of property in Davis and I'd spent some time with a group who wanted to do an intentional community. And at that time, nobody was doing edible landscaping in 72, 73 or natural drainage. And uh, of course, I'd already started building solar houses at the time, passive solar houses. So I felt if I laid this out properly, all the houses would have really good solar access. If we chose the right trees that would shade, uh, shade the houses in the summer but allow sun in the winter time, that we could have uh, good passive arch solar architecture. There was no reason we couldn't have solar water heating on everything. So those were kind of the three main things, the natural drainage, uh, uh, edible landscape, and passive solar design. We felt that at that point we were going to be doing a lot. Now, in the beginning, we also wanted to uh, recycle the uh, wastewater. And we had a plan that on the north we would uh, have a forest and we would have a series of septic tanks that would uh, uh, basically filter out the sediment and then ultimately the leach lines would go into large orchards. That was the one innovation that we weren't able to do. All of this is achieved even without the grey water, which could be included, and the black water, and the nutrient that comes with that. So we could be, go beyond this with all of that included. Oh, of course you could. And, and, and it just really started with water plan, access plan, structural positions, mm -hmm. the basic mainframe approach, right. and then the biology just took up those positions so well. The remaining land is just so abundant. I mean, there's food everywhere. <laughs> there is literally food everywhere. People don't realize what value they have here. These old fruit trees can't be replanted. There's just, there's fruit everywhere. It, it's an iconic, subdivision that can be replicated across the world and now is the time it needs to be it has to be and the value has to be understood this should be a world heritage site really it's a world heritage heritage site in my opinion if they needed to you could probably produce 70 percent of your food right here on this site if you if you pushed it with chickens and rabbits you might even up that. The problem is we don't have a grain growing area here. And so there would, should, there would be some supplemental property. At one point I was trying to talk the board of directors into buying an adjacent 100 acres for, for grain production, but it didn't go anywhere. We have 273 houses within this 60 acre block of land because they're just lost in amongst all this. There's so many green spaces. There's still so many open spaces. 
There are water flows and swells which are creating the long-term forestry. This feels like 300 acres of landscape. When you look at an open field like this was originally, it looks very small, it's not that big. You imagine 273 houses being overcrowding. That's almost exactly the same density as a normal suburb, but here it's totally expanded in space, which is also totally expanded in time because the succession of the forests is something you're engaging. You can see that this is 30 years of ongoing ecological development as well as environmental but human development within this. This is the future of human settlement. So here is a orchard picking ladder and every community orchard here has one. They just left lying around so that anybody in the community can come in and pick their own fruit. Nobody steals the ladder. It's just sitting here waiting to be used. So whenever you need a, a fruit from one of these beautiful trees, it's there for you. You can use the ladder. And this is a, a wonderful plum. This one I just picked and that one just fell off the tree. It's got a little bit of bird damage, but I don't mind sharing it with a, with a bird there. I had these the other day and it's haunted me. It's such a beautiful plum. There's something a bit unusual here. I've never eaten so much fruit straight off trees and every fruit tastes good. Every, that doesn't always happen. You get a sour one, you get one that doesn't taste so good, you get one that's not quite ripe or it's overripe. Here, every fruit I've tasted tastes great. Really tasty, really high quality. It must be the swales. It must, that's what I think it is. It's the swales picking up all the runoff water from the suburb, all the extra water pulled in, soaked down through the landscape every winter, drawing air through behind it taking the roots, giving those roots a passage right down to the deep mineral sources. And those trees now are 30, some of these trees are 38 years old. There's some new ones, but they all taste good. They must have deep access to minerals because they're just gorgeous. I've never been in a situation where that much surplus fruit is on the ground. I've had to clean it off my boots. I've been walking through fruit. There's so much abundance here and this is a mature system. You cannot purchase a mature system. You can't transplant a 30 year old apple tree like this. No matter how much money you've got, you cannot buy one of these. This is what I consider absolute true wealth. This is such an example that people need to know is possible and you need 30 years to put it in and we should be starting right now. This is definitely desirable and I will do my utmost to convince people that this is what we should do, we can do and we can do it for you. All you need is to understand permaculture design and how it's applied. Water harvesting, access patterns, structural positions, and beneficial productive biology, and it all flourishes. Over 30 years, it comes to absolute stability, it's self-cycling, it gathers its own nutrient, it gives you the best quality of life, food, vitality, and health. What more could you want? True wealth, here it is.